Tim Tackett needs no introduction. Uh, I will say only that he is, of course, the author of many books on the French Revolution, which have done so much to illuminate our understanding of those events. His most recent book, The Coming of the Terror in the French Revolution, amongst many things, helps us to understand more the connections between uh, the politics of terror and the emotions that were driving the deputies. Great book, and I'm thrilled to say has now been translated into French. He gave me an advanced copy yesterday <laughs> under the title uh, L'Anatomie de la Terre, Edition du. Sorry, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sorry. And the title of Tim's paper today is The Panic of May 1792. Thank you. In the last week of May, 1792, a wave of fear swept over the city of Paris. A surge of intense, collective, and highly contagious anxiety touching all segments of the society, an experience that we might well describe as panic. The terrifying rumors, terrifying rumors coursed through the streets that aristocrats and brigands in their pay were planning a coup to attack patriots throughout the city dissolve the National Assembly, and perhaps murder the deputies. People began spotting large numbers of strangers prowling about, the sinistres, the perfides, the feroces, as they were described. Uh, sto stories circulated also of secret meetings of aristocrats uh, at somewhere unspecified at night, some of whom were said to be wearing the white cocade of the royalists. Many began hearing strange noises at night from what they believed to be suspicious carriages or marching horses passing through the city. And to make matters worse, word also spread that the king, Louis XVI, was planning another escape from the Tuileries Palace to be coordinated with an attack on Paris. By the end of May, according to contemporary witnesses, a great many Parisians were shaking with fear, afraid even to leave their homes. To be sure, it was hardly the first panic of this sort to spread through the city during the Revolution. The experience and effects of the great fear of July 1789 are well known from Georges Lefebvre's classics, classic study. As we know from private correspondence and newspapers, there had been similar outbreaks of panic-like fears among the popular classes every few weeks or months from 1789 through 1792. But the Panic of May 92 was different and not unlike the great fear in that it was also felt intensely by the social and political elites of the city. The municipal government of Paris, the administrators of the Department of the Seine, many of the sections of the city, the major clubs and fraternal societies, and ultimately the legislative assembly itself all were deeply affected and by May 28th, all had declared themselves to be in permanent emergency sessions, meeting around the clock to confront the anticipated attacks. The gates of the city were locked, and the National Guard was mobilized and constantly on the move, patrolling the streets, ready to confront evildoers. To facilitate the patrols, the mayor ordered an illumination of the city, of the streets, with all citizens required to keep candles or lanterns burning in their windows throughout the night. The constant movement of guardsmen, often accompanied by drum rolls, only further rattled the population, who sometimes mistook the marching National Guards for the expected brigands. Soon several of the neighborhood sections were also intervening directly in the crisis, with thousands of armed men and women marching repeatedly to surround the Tuileries Palace and prevent a flight of the king and to protect the legislative assembly. But the events of late May were different in two other ways from earlier panics. First, the ultimate source of the imagined attack was not located in the prisons or in brigands arriving from the outside, but in the royal palace itself, in the nefarious Austrian committee thought to have taken control of the king. 
Second, the panic would directly affect the actions of the Legislative Assembly and the course of the revolution. Indeed, not since the summer of 89 did intense, punctuated fear play such a role in directly influencing revolutionary action. <coughs> There's no time this morning to explore the event in any detail. And it hasn't been uh, really, uh, it's scarcely mentioned in the literature. You'd be hard pressed to find this uh, popping up in any of the syntheses uh, on the French Revolution. So first, I want to reflect on the possible origins of the panic. And second, I want to offer brief observations on the impact of the emotions generated by the incident on ensuing revolutionary events. In doing so, I rely on a wide range of documents, but above all, on the private correspondence of contemporary citizens and on the accounts of a selection of about a dozen newspapers of the period. As for the sources of the panic, it's useful to distinguish the longer term and the more immediate origins of the event. In a recent study, I wrote at some length on the emergence of a culture of fear and mistrust among both the elites and the popular elements of society during the first three years of the revolution. And there's really no time to re repeat that de development. But by the fall of 1791, it's clear that one could already observe among the political elites a widespread belief in the existence of a grand, grande conspiration, a great conspiracy, a grand conspiracy in which virtually everything that went wrong in France, from high bread prices and the fall of the Assignat, the peasant uprisings and religious unrest, was thought to be caused by a small group of counter-revolutionaries pulling the strings in secret. This paranoid style of politics emerging out of, uh, not, I would argue, from pre-revolutionary thought, but out of the very revolutionary process itself, was already very much in evidence before the outbreak of war. <coughs> Nevertheless, there can be no doubt that the war officially declared in April of 1792 intensified the atmosphere of fear and uncertainty. Inspired by the soaring rhetoric of Jacques Brissot and his Girondin associates during the winter and spring of 1791-92, the great majority of the deputies in the Legislative Assembly had become convinced that the war would inevitably be successful, that the French armed forces of free men could rapidly crush the slave armies of Austria and Prussia, that they would be welcomed with open arms by Belgian and German citizens anxious to be liberated by the French. This supreme optimism can clearly be seen in the private correspondence of the deputies during this period. So among the most important short-term causes of the panic at the end of May was precisely the disastrous failure of the French army in late April and early May. As we know, the first timid entry of French forces into the Austrian lowlands saw a near rout with the French retreating in disarray after the first few shots were fired. Thereafter, and for the next several weeks, the army of the revolution remained static and inactive in defensive positions on the frontier, and the major generals of the French army refused to engage in any combat whatsoever. The total military failure after the extraordinary confidence in hubris when war was first declared was a bitter blow to the patriots and immediately gave rise to suspicions of treachery and betrayal by the aristocratic officers leading the army, which the elites were only too ready to link to the grand conspiracy that they had been anticipating for over a year. In fact, it was extremely difficult to have accurate news of, about the events on the frontier, a paucity of reliable information that is commonly one of the key factors in the, in the rise of the improvised news of rumor. But in the spring of 1792, the rumor mills were also fed by at least three other developments. First, there can be no doubt that a significant number of unknown faces were indeed appearing in Paris, precisely the large number of nobles en, en route to join the immigrant armies, <coughs> immigrants who often stopped to salute ostentatiously the king whom they claimed to be defending and promised to return and liberate. Second, there was a su substantial force of royalists permanently stationed in Paris. 
especially the openly counter-revolutionary nobles manning the king's royal bodyguard. Both the immigrants and the royal guardsmen could sometimes be found drinking in the cabarets and announcing to whomever would listen that the days of the revolution were numbered. Third, perhaps through the influence and participation of the various young aristocrats in the city, there been a variety of nighttime acts calculated to frighten the patriots, cutting down a liberty tree in the middle of the night in the Palais Royal, or putting up threatening posters announcing a com coming counter-revolution and the killing of selected patriot deputies. All such activities were strongly supported, moreover, by the extreme far-right press that delighted in taunting the patriots and predicting their imminent downfall and bloody repression. But there can be no doubt that the key trigger to the panic of late May was the pronouncement in the Legislative Assembly on the 23rd of the month of May of two dramatic speeches by Jacques Brissot and his friend from Bordeaux, Armand Jansonnet. We will probably never know for certain the motivation of Brissot and his Girondin friend in delivering their speeches. Like most of their colleagues in the assembly, they firmly believed in the reality of a grand conspiracy. Yet it is also clear that the group felt under great pressure after the failure of their war policy uh, that they had championed. Blaming the military failure on conspiracy was an excellent tactic for diverting attention from the Girondins' own responsibility. In any case, the two speeches on May 23rd had been well publicized in advance and drew an enormous attendance from the Parisians in the sitting in the balconies of the assembly or out scattered around in the streets surrounding the hall. Both speeches developed a great, in great detail the supposed nefarious conspiracies of this Austrian committee and the Tuileries to waylay the war effort, to send the war plans to the enemy, to organize concurrently a coup against Paris and the assembly itself. In any case, the two speeches had a powerful effect on all those present. When Brissot had finished his delivery, the entire assembly and all the spectators in the hall remained in stunned silence for several minutes, with no one coming forward to speak, an almost unprecedented event for the normally loquacious deputies. When eventually the session continued, virtually all the members, both Jacobin and Feuillon, seemed persuaded by, by the arguments, no doubt because so many were already convinced of the existence of such a conspiracy. Even Viennot de Vaublanc, the former noble and one of the most influential leaders of the Feuillant group, favorably acknowledged the speeches of Jean Sonnet and Brissot and demanded that they be printed and circulated. And then on the morning of May 26th, with the population already on edge, a huge explosion rocked the city. A powder depot near the Châtelet on the central right bank blew up, killing several individuals and causing considerable damage and broken windows throughout the neighborhood. The detonation was ultimately shown to have been an accident. Someone had walked among the powder kegs with a lighted pipe. But the explosion was heard throughout the city, and many citizens were terrified that it was the first act of the plot that everyone had anticipated. And it was precisely in the days following this accident that the panic reached its greatest intensity, with the National Guard mobilized, the armed sections marching to the aid of the National Assembly, and all the major institutions in the city declaring themselves to be in permanent session to confront the crisis. In retrospect, the whole panic incident was a rather bizarre affair, not unlike the great fear of 1789 and the Virtually the entire population was thrown into a state of intense anxiety over a plot that in all likelihood never existed. Indeed, the mayor of Paris, Jérôme Pétion, directly compared the situation to that of the summer of 89. In both cases, the fear and the uncertainty became so intense that rumors and the emotions accompanying those rumors moved rapidly both upward and downward through society between normally separate emotional communities and significantly affected the social and political elites who were usually more skeptical, skeptical of such rumors. 
Moreover, like the great fear and indeed like the panic of March 1793, which I've looked at elsewhere, the panic of May 1792 would have considerable consequences on, a revo on revolutionary events. And here I would note <coughs> three important developments. First, the panic marked another important step in the delegitimization of the king. Since Louis signed the new constitution in September 1791 and the Legislative Assembly had begun its sessions, <coughs> virtually the, all the patriots had been willing to forgive him for his flight to Varan. Patriots on the left had ceased calling for a republic, and rhetoric in the assembly critical of the royal government had been generally directed against the queen and the king's ministers. Even Brissot in his May 23rd speech had invoked the image of the good king badly advised. But now pamphlets and newspapers and on the left increasingly indicted Louis himself. And for, for, for the first time since the summer of 1791, there were open demands for the creation of a republic. Second, the Panic of May led to a series of major changes in the sections of Paris. It was an important step in, the, in their emergence as largely independent armed bodies. To meet the perceived crisis, even passive citizens and occasionally women were invited to take up arms with, with their sections to surround the Tuileries Palace and protect the National Assembly. But it was also an important step in the creation of permanent sections, their right to meet daily to debate all manner of questions and draw petitions. Third, the crisis would lead to a temporary unity of action among the majority of the normally deeply divided deputies, now joined together to confront the imagined crisis. In Rosalie Julien's description, it was as if the Holy Spirit of Pentecost had descended on the deputies as they voted nearly unanimously to meet in a permanent session. And this, was, uh, this took place on the Monday after Pentecost. Over the next two weeks, a solid majority, a de facto coalition of Jacobins, members of the moderate plain, and even some Feuillon, voted three major, major measures of legislation, a harsh law against the refractory clergy, the disbanding of the royal bodyguard, and a decree, a famous decree really, summoning volunteers from throughout the country, soon to be known as the Fédéré, to march to the capital to protect the city and then, in theory, move on to, into the countryside to confront the invading foreign armies. The king would reluctant, reluctantly accept the destruction of his bodyguard, but he would quickly veto both the repression of the refractory clergy and the summoning, summoning of the Federé to, uh, to Paris. For many patriots, the two vetoes constituted additional evidence that the king was insidiously obstructing the war effort and the repression of internal enemies who were, it was believed, were believed working hand in hand with the invading foreign powers. In any case, many in many regions of France, with the delegitimization of the king's authority, local pa patriots would simply ignore Louis' vetoes and follow the assembly's decree to send volunteers to Paris <coughs> and to implement portions of the decree against the refractories. In conclusion, it is by no means my intention to discount the role of reason in the revolution and the substantial effects of rational thought in the construction of the new regime and the new set of laws being voted and in the foundation declarations on which that regime was grounded. Yet revolutionary times are not the same as normal times and both the intense enthusiasm which such, such events arouse and which we've just heard about and the threats of, and uncertainties at the same time, which those events commonly unleashed, would give rise to a range of powerful emotions from joy, hope, and collective love in the form of fraternity to more negative emotions such as fear, anger, <laughs> hatred, and the desire for revenge. Emotions that would generally, would measurably influence behavior. And of course, if we rely on recent neurological and social science research, it seems clear that there is always a close interconnection between cognition and affect, between reason and emotion. 
emotions, including the particularly intense form of collective fear we have defined here as panic, could have a major and sometimes creative effect on revolutionary policy. The panic of May 1792, as I've described it, would seem to be a case in point. Indeed, I would argue that th this intensely emotional experience and the legislation that emerged out of it was an important first step in the concatenation of events that would lead to the king's dismissal of the Girondin ministers on June the 12th, to the journée of June 20th <coughs> when the armed sections confronted the king in his palace, to the storming of the palace on August 10th, and ultimately to the overthrow of the monarchy and the creation of a republic. Thanks. <laughs>